Hello and welcome to today's webinar on our 2021 calendar, part one of our Sexually Speaking Brain Injury Development and Behavior Series offered by the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators. I'm Maria Crowley with NASHA. I'll be your moderator for today. Haley Cushion, our coordinator for member services and communications is our webinar organizer. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, NASHA is a nonprofit organization, as you know, created to assist state government in promoting partnerships and building systems to meet the needs of individuals with brain injury and their families. We used the GoToWebinar platform for this webinar. They provide online support should you experience any issues. Handouts of today's presentation are available for download. Check your attendee control panel for the handouts pane. Please submit your questions in the questions pane on your control panel, and we will try to answer those questions at the end. If we run out of time, we'll just save those and the presenters hopefully can respond to your questions at a later time via email and we'll get those back out to you. Continuing education credits for social work, certified rehabilitation counseling are going to be available as well as general certificates of attendance for today's event. At the end of the live webinar, you'll receive an email with an evaluation. Pay close attention to this part. The CEs are bundled for this series. So in order to receive credit, you'll need to listen and complete the evaluations for all three parts in the series. Then you'll receive your certificate. Uh, the webinar is also going to be archived for later access on our website. It'll be under the trainings on demand. For viewers of the recording, please go to that section of our website to find information on how to receive a certificate. I would now love to introduce you to this series and the presenters that you guys are gonna be fortunate to hear today. Uh, sexuality is an integral part of being human. Uh, development is one of the most significant stages in a person's life. Love, affection, sexual intimacy contribute to healthy relationships and feeling connected and individual well-being is so important to us. Sustaining a brain injury can interfere with someone's ability for healthy sexual development and positive and sexual relationships. We're gonna focus on today's webinar on sexual development and what happens when a brain injury disrupts that development. I'm very happy to introduce you to our two presenters, uh, Dr. Mary Romano. Uh, we'll go first. She's working in the Division of Adolescent Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics at Vanderbilt University. A medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. She attended Dartmouth, then earned her medical degree from St. George's University uh, in Grenada. She completed her pediatric residency at Winthrop on Long Island and served as chief resident there. She completed her fellowship in adolescent medicine at Miami Children's Hospital. Uh, she also holds a master's degree in public health and her work is focused on adolescent gynecology, contraceptive management, and medically complex patients, menstrual issues uh, for individuals with intellectual disabilities, and LGBTQI2 health. Welcome. Uh, Rachel Kaplan is our second presenter. Um, she is founder of Kintsugi Consulting, um, which provides training and consult related to disability inclusion, education, accessibility, and representation. Rachel also holds a master's degree in public health and a master certificate in drug and addiction studies from the University of South Carolina. She has extensive experience working with homeless populations, youth services and programming, youth with disabilities, sexuality, health education, mental health awareness, suicide prevention, crisis intervention, sexual assault and domestic violence advocacy. Thank you so much for joining us and I'm gonna stop talking and turn it over to you. Thanks so much for having us. We're excited to be here. Yeah. Um, so as Maria said, we're going to talk about adolescent sexual health and traumatic brain injury. Next slide, please. So our goals for today are going to be to review the physical, psychological, and neurobiological changes that occur during adolescence. Because while, you know, sexuality and relationships and romance and affection are an important part of all phases of life. It certainly is really center stage in adolescence because there's just so much change going on and so much um, active development that affects these things. We're gonna discuss a little bit about how a neurologic injury such as a TBI or a mild traumatic brain injury, um, and you'll see that nomenclature or those 
abbreviations there again, so TBI or mild TBI might disrupt this dynamic process, both the physical and psychological effects. We'll highlight best practices for providing culturally competent care to adolescents who have experienced a TBI or a mild TBI, and then we'll discuss how to best support families as they navigate the challenges of parenting an adolescent who has experienced a TBI or mild TBI. And again, I think some of the stuff that we talk about will hold true for all adolescent healthcare, but really something that we want those who care for those with TBIs to be aware of. Next slide, please. So one thing in terms of nomenclature, I think adolescence versus puberty are terms that are sometimes used interchangeably, but are not the same thing. So adolescence is a dynamic process characterized by simultaneous plus asynchronous development in several areas. So it does include physical changes, but there are psychological and neurobiological changes that occur as well. So you enter adolescence as a child, but you often leave or you should leave adolescence as an adult. Puberty specifically refers to the physical changes or the physical development that occurs during adolescence. And for most people, that defines the onset of adolescence. So adolescence typically starts with puberty, but puberty is over well before all of the other changes of adolescence will occur. Next slide, please. So, Rachel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So, um, yeah, so Mary and I really wanted to kind of help with the difference between TBI and mild TBI, which is also known as MTBI, um, and is pretty frequently known as concussion just because they are two different things, and we don't want to throw out acronyms or words that we don't give you any kind of explanation or differentiation on. So an MTBI, a mild traumatic brain injury, um, is also known as a concussion, and it typically resolves within 28 days. And a TBI, or traumatic brain injury, um, results in long-term or lifelong impact. So that's why MTBI and concussion kind of go hand in hand, um, because they're more temporary for the most part. Um, both can cause changes in someone's physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral functioning, which impacts daily life at work, school, employment, anywhere that somebody is you know, living and thriving and interacting. Um, and this includes within relationship dynamics, which is why we're having this conversation about TBI and sexuality and sexual development. Um, so a TBI or a mild TBI is one type of brain injury. And just to, to make sure we're all on the same page, brain injury is classified as a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's an, um, an act that was signed into law in 1990. And a disability is just kind of defined as something that impacts your day-to-day -day life in one or more ways. So when we're talking about some of the needs that somebody with a brain injury might have, they fall under that category of a disability. So we just wanted to make that pretty clear um, and just kind of make that known since people who have a disability are often met with a lot of bias and stereotypes and barriers and lack to access. And we want to make sure that's not the case. Um, when we're talking about sexual health. Um, Mary, did you want to add anything? No, I think that's perfect. I think that was okay. a really good discussion of the clarification. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so next slide, please. So, hearkening back to what we were talking about. So puberty is the physical changes through which a child's body matures and becomes capable of reproduction, right? So in theory, for females, puberty starts with breast development, followed typically by the development of pubic hair, and it culminates in getting your period or menarche. And so once you get your period, you technically are capable of reproduction. And that's kind of the goal of puberty. Obviously, we do not need 12 and 13 year olds reproducing, but biologically and evolutionarily, that's what's going on. We know that puberty is mediated by sex steroids. It is variable in onset, timing, and tempo, right? So it'll start at different times for different people. Um, certainly some people are early bloomers, some people are late bloomers. There are medical definitions of precocious puberty, so there is an age at which it is too young to begin, and we might need to think about stopping it. And then there's also a delay. Uh, there is a medical criteria for which somebody has delayed puberty, or there's an age at which it's too late for puberty not to have begun. And in those patients, there might be some kind of workup. And certainly, as you can expect, a TBI may impact puberty. We know that the onset trajectory of puberty is influenced by genetics, general health and nutrition, environmental and socioeconomic factors. 
there are racial and ethnic variations also seen. And I think that's important to keep in mind when you see patients to put their development in the context of this. And we know with some great data that we've got and some more data that's hopefully coming, that the onset of puberty difference between African Americans, Hispanics, and Caucasians. Next slide, please. We do see that for African American girls, the mean age of thalarchy, which is when breast development starts, and that's typically the first thing that happens with puberty, it's about nine and a half years. It's almost a full year later in Caucasians, which is about 10 and a half years. We have data on Mexican American girls that it's slightly later slightly later than African Americans, but still earlier than Caucasians. As we are all well aware, Hispanics are a heterogeneous group. And so we often lump Hispanic data sort of all together, but really the data that we have is on Mexican Americans. So the things I would highlight on this are the fact that African Americans start puberty almost a full year earlier than Caucasian girls, and they get their period almost six to 10 months earlier than um, Caucasians as well. So there's definitely ethnic variations, and so you need to keep this in mind and sort of put that into some context when you're seeing patients and sort of thinking about where they may be at in puberty and adolescence. Next slide, please. Um, tanner staging is the word is what we use to stage the physical progression through puberty. So there are known predictable stages through which people go when they go through puberty. And so often you'll see at a patient's annual physical with their primary care provider, we will document what tanner stage that they are. It's helpful when parents have questions about, hey, when is my period coming? What's going on with puberty? But it also helps us if there are concerns for delayed puberty or early puberty, if we can look back and see sort of how we've staged things over time. Um, we know that variations in the timing of puberty can have significant psychological impacts on adolescents. And it's interesting because the effect seems to be different for girls as opposed to boys. So girls who develop late seem to not really be affected by that one way or the other, just as boys who develop early seem to not have any sort of real negative impacts felt. However, in girls who have early puberty, we do see a lot of significant negative um, psychological or psychosocial changes. So girls who develop early tend to have issues with self-esteem, body image, we tend to see these girls engage in higher risk sexual behaviors than those who develop later. And I think we can all appreciate that there may be a 10, 11, 12 year old girl who's gone through puberty and maybe looks 15 or 16, but when we talk about adolescent brain development, you know, your brain develops at the same trajectory and pace, whether you start puberty at 9, 10, or 12. And so we can certainly understand that in girls that develop early, there may be a disconnect between their physical appearance and their emotional ability and capacity to engage in risk-taking behaviors, decision-making about risk-taking behaviors. And then boys seem to be more negatively affected or more bothered by developing late. So boys who start puberty later than their average or later than peers tend to have more issues with self-esteem not necessarily risk-taking behaviors, but more self-esteem and body image satisfaction. Um, we also know that for girls especially, when we look at sort of adolescent brain development and the stages of adolescence, it'll sort of make more sense, but we know that for girls, puberty is often done pretty early on for girls, right? By 12, 12 and a half, most girls have gotten their period and their physical adolescent changes are done, but there's still lots of brain and psychological development that needs to come. And so I think that's important when we think about physical development versus emotional and cognitive development. I think that's probably even more important when you look at an adolescent that sustained a TBI. Next slide. And this is just a graphical representation, and I don't think I have control of my arrow, so I will try and describe it really well so you know where I'm pointing. Um, so what we see is, you know, sexual development in girls typically starts around 9 or 10, and by 13 or 14, that's really the tail end of done, but for most girls, it's done between 12 and 13 years of age. For boys, what we see is that puberty starts a little bit later, and you can see that curve is much wider, so it occurs over a longer period of time. And so for boys, the physical changes of puberty plus the emotional and cognitive changes that we see are probably all happening simultaneously during that curve, whereas for girls, you kind of see puberty, and then the emotional and cognitive changes are coming simultaneously, but really well beyond when the physical changes have ended. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about adolescent brain development. So I think this is super interesting because I think the physical body, breast, body hair changes were very apparent to us because you could see it. 
only in the last 10 to 15 years, thanks to technology and curiosity, have we done more research into what's actually going on in the adolescent brain during this time to give us some more really good information about adolescent brain development, because it's really quite dynamic and much more dynamic than we realized. Next slide, please. So this is just for everyone's amusement. I think when we think about the teenage brain, we think about lots of space being devoted to things that are not so helpful and putting the adolescent brain at risk with not very much time devoted to smart, healthy decision-making skills. That's okay, next slide is fine. <laughs> it's just to get a giggle. So what are the psychosocial tasks of adolescence? What should you do by the time you turn 18? You should emotionally separate from your parents. You should have a greater sense of personal identity. You should identify with a peer group. These are my people, this is who I am. You should have an increased importance to your body image, so care enough to keep it healthy, keep it clean, um, but also accept the body that you have and appreciate that your body is what your body is and you are there to sort of accept it and love it and love yourself. And then establish a sexual, vocational, and moral identity. Again, especially when you get to four and five, I think these are some skills that adults are still working on, but in theory, when we sort of say, what should you do as an adolescent, this is kind of, where we want you to be by the time you emerge as an adult. And again, you can appreciate how a TBI is gonna definitely impact on all of these things, right? So how can you emotionally separate from your parents if you become more dependent on them because of an injury? How do you identify with a peer group if perhaps the TBI is keeping you out of school and keeping you out of activities? You know, How do you establish a sexual identity if a TBI has affected your ability to sort of engage in relationships and figure out what is your sexual behavior? Next slide. Rachel, do you want to weigh in on any of that? I realized I think I didn't. I realized I didn't ask you that for. No, honestly, you mentioned anything that I was going to talk about in those stages. So, so we're like we're good. We're smart brain. Yes. All right. <laughs> so when we think about adolescent psychosocial development. It's a little bit different than Tanner staging, right? So Tanner staging was the physical changes of puberty. You're going from one to two to three to four to five. You're not going back and forth. As you would expect, psychosocial development isn't really a linear, predictable process. It'll look different in different people. People may spend more time in early adolescence. They may go back and forth between stages. It's really less of a predictable linear process. But for better or for worse, we divide it into three stages. There's early adolescence, which is about 11 to 13 years of age, middle adolescence, which is 14 to 16 years of age, and then late adolescence, which is 17 to 21 years of age. And what you'll see is changed is, I don't know how many years ago, but you know, when I first started 10, 15 years ago, adolescence, late adolescence ended at 18, right? At 18, everyone was magically supposed to become an adult and be capable of doing all the things. I think we can all appreciate from our own lives or perhaps from the lives of our children that there are some 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 year olds that are still working their way out of late adolescence and establishing their identity as an adult. And I think when we look at adolescent brain development and the fact that it's still happening well into the 20s, it is not shocking that 18 is not this magical cutoff age at which you should know and be capable of doing all the things. Next slide. So I just sort of try to, to break down what you typically see in the different phases. And I guess in your brain, maybe think about the 11 to 13 year olds that you know. So in early adolescence, what do you see? For some, there's rapid physical changes. But if you think back to when an African-American may start puberty, it's possible that by the time they enter early adolescence, that may already be done, but it's definitely when you're at least sort of confronted with a lot of physical changes to your body. So not shockingly, what you see is a lot of uncertainty about appearance. Do I look like others? Am I like others? And a, more of a preoccupation with self and self-image. You definitely see more of an intense relationship with peers. You see an increased importance of peer relationships, sometimes to the detriment of their relationship with their parents. And you start to see a little bit more separation from parents and an increased need for privacy. Next slide, please. Middle adolescence is where all the good stuff happens. So you really start to see this maximal, this, this real drive to separate from your parents. You sort of tend to see the most parental conflicts at this age. So there's an attempt to separate from parents. Other adults may take on more of a role at that age. So in a perfect world, those are, are adults you want to be role models for your children. So coaches and teachers and pastors and those sorts of things. You definitely see a powerful um, influence of peer groups Again, you hope that that's a positive effect and not a negative effect. 
For most people by middle adolescence, your physical puberty changes are done. So you'd like for people to have more an acceptance of their body image. Sometimes there isn't, and that's where we often will see the start of eating disorders. But because you've kind of got this new body, there is definitely an increased preoccupation with how can I make my body more attractive, right? And this may be where you see a little bit more experimentation with style of dress, color of hair, what can I pierce, you know, what do I want to be today? You definitely start to see more sexual relationships and sexual experimentation. So people are sort of just figuring out who they are. For some people, who they are in middle adolescence will be who they continue to, you know, that will be how they continue to identify. For others, it may be a period of experimentation until they sort of settle on where they feel like they are. And then you definitely see these feelings of omnipotence, right? So there's an increase in risk-taking behaviors. Oop, back, yeah, nope. Yep. So you see this feeling of omnipotence, right? An increase in risk-taking behaviors. You see this inability to see cause and effect. So you often see limited capacity for abstract reasoning, right? What you see is, I want to do this because this is going to feel good now without the capacity for your prefrontal cortex to weigh in and say, mm, that might not be a great idea. Next slide, please. And then in late adolescence, you're supposed to figure it all out, right? You're supposed to re-accept your parents, accept your body, know who your sexual and moral identity is, and really have the ability to compromise and set limits. And again, not to sort of belabor the point, but we can all appreciate that this is probably a bit of a dynamic process that looks different in different people and can absolutely be impacted by any chronic illness that affects your ability to sort of establish this. And certainly a TBI um, would fall under this category. Next slide, please. So what do we know about the adolescent brain and how it develops? Lots of awesome things. So we now know that the adolescent brain is really a very dynamic organ and that it's continuing to develop during adolescence and well into young adulthood. So even though 90% of the actual gross architecture and structure of the brain is done by six years of age, right? Your head circumference isn't changing during adolescence. But what we see is beneath the surface, there's lots of dynamic changes going on to the physical architecture of the brain. So there's a second growth spurt at the onset of adolescence, followed by significant organization of the gray and white matter, right? So the white matter is the myelin or the insulation that goes around the gray meaty fibers of your brain. So the gray and white matter components continue to undergo pretty significant dynamic changes throughout adolescence and somewhat into young adulthood. Next slide, please. Oh, can I just um, absolutely go back really quick, guys? No, so, no, no. Um, so this kind of means that, you know, decision making, consequences versus reward, the complex problem solving are not really strengths of adolescents. Um, and so that's across the board, whether somebody has a TBI or doesn't have a TBI. And when, you know, when Mary was talking about early versus middle versus late adolescence, um, there are a lot of reasons why somebody might fall within multiple categories, even if their age says that they're in one of those stages of adolescence. So TBI can be one of them, um, but trauma can be another one. So especially if you think about somebody who has experienced a traumatic brain injury and they have some PTSD or some trauma because of that, that's going to also play into kind of where they relate and how they act in terms of those adolescent stages. So that's all I wanted to throw in. Here, okay. good to go to the next slide. <laughs> So this is just for anybody who wants to know so much more than what I'm about to talk about. We've had some pretty awesome studies done through the National Institute of Mental Health. The first big Sentinel study was done by Dr. Jay Geed back in 2000. He took about 400 adolescent brains and did serial scans over a period of about eight to nine years. And he did more than just plain old MRIs, right? So plain old MRIs tell us really good information about the structure of the brain, but he also did something called a functional MRI as well as something called diffuser, no, sorry, diffuse tensor imaging, not a radiologist. But those two types of imaging allowed us to not just see what the brain looks like, but to look at what part of the brain is turned on, how the brain is communicating amongst itself. So it gave us really good information about not just what the brain looks like, but actual brain function. And that study, you know, yielded so much great information that the, there's now something called the ABCD study. Um, it started in 2015, it was renewed in 2020, but it's 21 sites, it's 10,000 plus adolescents who are gonna start at age nine and be sort of serial, serially screened over 10 years. If anybody's really curious, there's the website, but they're gonna look at lots of things and how it affects brain development. Substance use, environmental factors, trauma, 
social factors, I think a big thing, social media and screen time. Um, and then they've started to sort of allow that data to be shared for anyone who wants to access it so that hopefully lots of people will utilize this to ask lots of good questions and get the rest of us lots of good answers. Next slide, please. So there are three distinct things that occur during adolescent brain development. Proliferation, the brain grows. Pruning, the body prunes back the parts of the brains it chooses, you know, that depending on sort of what, well, let me back up. There's proliferation and then there's pruning. So what we know is you grow and then you actually decrease in brain matter or brain volume. I think a big source of interest is what predicts pruning. Is it use it or lose it? You know, my brain prunes when I'm not using. Is it genetics? Is it environmental, toxin screen or media? But I think there's a lot of interest in what gets pruned, why does it get pruned, and what are the long-term effects of that? And then the third process is the myelination, which is the laying down of myelin or white matter. I think of it as insulation of the gray matter that remains. And this process, proliferation, pruning, and myelination, has a very predictable sequence. So we know what parts of the brain develop first and what parts of the brain develop later. So the under so the under part of the brain is the limbic system the over part of the brain is the cortex and what we know is that the limbic system or the reward center of the brain gets up and running and proliferating quickly that's the part of your brain that's stimulated by dopamine that's the part of your brain that says what am i going to do that's going to make me feel good and it's all about reward the prefrontal cortex is sort of the front part of the brain, as the name would imply, and that's the part of your brain that's responsible for abstract reasoning. I call it the butt part of your brain, B-U-T, not B-T-T. I would love to do this because my limbic system says it's going to feel good, but it could kill me. It could get me arrested. It could get me in trouble. And that butt part of the brain that allows adolescents the ability to stop and think and evaluate risk and reward develops much later on in adolescence than the limbic system. And that's really what puts the adolescents at risk to engage in these risk-taking behaviors. Why didn't they realize that this would happen? And it's not intentional disobedience. It's not a lack of intelligence. It's often just the fact that their brain is not yet hardwired to sort of a, for the prefrontal cortex to kick in, but I think more importantly for the prefrontal cortex to work in conjunction with the limbic system so that they're communicating and communicating efficiently and allowing for the brain to sort of simultaneously access both parts of it to make a smart decision. And as you can appreciate, different adolescents for lots of different reasons will develop those skills sooner or later versus, you know, based on what they get exposed to, how their parents work with them, what sort of opportunities they have, and certainly a TBI would be a thing that can affect or interfere with this development. And those perceived levels of risk um, at that stage, typically if you know an adolescent does something that's dangerous and they don't have that immediate consequence, then it's kind of this all or nothing thinking of, well, then nothing bad will ever happen when I engage in this activity. So they kind of have this sense of, either something bad will always happen or something bad will never happen. And they can't really differentiate that sometimes you get lucky and it, it's not gonna happen every single time, so. Absolutely. I think the analogy, I don't think I have this in the later slide, so if I do, I'll apologize for repeating myself. Adolescents are sort of all gasoline, all accelerator, and sort of the prefrontal cortex is the, the brakes and the steering wheel. And until the prefrontal cortex kicks in, it's kind of up to parents and healthcare providers and adults to help guide the steering wheel and help them hit the brakes. Yep. Next slide, please. So these are just some pictures to kind of give a little bit of, um, to give an example that's better than my hand. Um, so if you look at yellow brain is lots of brain matter, dark blue, dark purple is less gray matter. And so what you see through time-lapse photography is that between age five and age 20, there is a significant decrease in the gray matter volume of the brain. And that is okay. That is what is supposed to happen. Next slide, please. Um, so again, I alluded a little bit to this, but you know, the big questions that we have and what we're hoping to garner from some of these studies is what drives pruning, right? So we do see a lot of adolescent mental illness declare itself during that adolescent time period. So a lot of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, schizophrenia, 
often blossom, I don't know if that's the right word because that makes it sound pretty, blossom during adolescence. We also see some things like ADHD or other things kind of fade a little bit or decrease. And again, is that related to pruning? You know, what role does genetics play? What do, role does exposure to things play? You know, literal exposure to things like substance use versus exposure to life. What happens if you play violin throughout your adolescence versus playing video games? You know, how does that drive your brain to remodel itself based on that? And then again, the opposite of pruning is sort of what we see with myelination. So while we see decrease increases in gray matter, we see significant increases in white matter throughout adolescence. And what that means is your brain operates much more efficiently once it's been appropriately myelinated or insulated. I think of it as sort of like an electrical analogy. Again, when we look at the brain in early and early middle adolescence, what we see is the whole brain lights up when stuff is going on. And over time, with improved and appropriate myelination, we see focal recruitment of pathways. We see that these connections between things like the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system are strengthened and working with much more optimum efficiency. So the brain just works better as you get older. I think you know the big thing that is, is enabled by myelination is something called cognitive flexibility, right? So my plan was to go to a party and I was gonna go with Thomas and Thomas was gonna be my driver and Thomas wasn't gonna drink so it was gonna be safe for him to drive me home. And then I get to the party and Thomas drinks and now I've gotta change my plan. The adolescent brain before all of these changes happen is just not hardwired correctly to pivot. So my plan was A and now I've gotta come up with a new plan that the adolescent brain doesn't yet have that cognitive flexibility because of the myelination and the gray matter changes that we see. And so adolescence ability to sort of rethink and be like, mm, my first plan wasn't so smart, I gotta come up with a second one, is often compromised. And those are skills that improve with time and practice and appropriate brain remodeling. Next slide. And this, see, there is the example that is better than my hand. So. What we see is a relative imbalance between these two systems during adolescence. So purple is limbic system, amygdala reward center, pink is prefrontal cortex, and they're kind of in this battle, and it takes a while for the prefrontal cortex to win. And when we look at functional MRIs, we see greater activity in the amygdala versus the prefrontal cortex when we look at adolescents who are in emotionally charged situations where you might need your prefrontal cortex to rein it in a little bit. And we see a heightened response to rewards and pleasure with a decreased capacity to control or weigh the risks. Next slide. And this is just a graphical representation of that. So the bottom black line represents your prefrontal cortex. The red top line represents the limbic system and that sort of hash marked area in between represents the imbalance between the two. And we see sort of that's that risky period until the two can catch up with each other and the brain can actually work more efficiently and with the two systems working symbiotically or cooperatively, it's probably a better word. Next slide. Okay, so I want to talk to you all a little bit about um, mental age theory and how it can be harmful. So when we're talking about the adolescent stages of development and where they're at and how the brain is growing and learning and developing, um, I want to make sure that we're not taking somebody's uh, mental age and giving them information based on that. So basically mental age theory is a way to measure an individual's maturity and intelligence by comparing their individual IQ score to the score on a standardized IQ test for peers of their same age group. And so what this does is it ends up insinuating that somebody with an intellectual disability or a developmental disability or a traumatic brain injury um, isn't the same as their peers of the same age. And so this ends up infantilizing individuals that have a TBI or have an intellectual or developmental disability. Um, and so it creates this belief that people with low IQ scores aren't acting their age, and it creates a difference in the information being provided to them. So for example, you might um, have, let's say, a young man who is 18, and what you'll hear is, oh, well, chronologically he's 18, but mentally he's 12. And we, we understand what you're trying to say with that is that there, this 18 year old has some kind of disability where they're maybe not on the same par as some of their peers that are also 18, but 
what this ends up doing is reducing a person from the actual age they are and treating them as their IQ level score. So especially when we're talking about sexual health and um, you know, preventative care information that instead of receiving information that's appropriate for an 18 year old based on puberty and adolescence, they're receiving information for someone much younger, which really doesn't address, you know, any of the healthy skill building behaviors about sexual health. Um, so they might not be learning about anatomy, about their body, about consent, about sexuality, condom use, birth control options, things that they need to do to keep themselves safe because they are 18 and all of these things are a factor in their life, even if they're not, even if that's something they're not interested in. Um, next slide, please. So when we think about adolescents and TBIs, I mean, I think it's a, it's a multifactorial injury that is going to affect adolescents differently. So, you know, for some, the injury can actually affect and or interrupt the trajectory of development. And we certainly see that for injuries that occur early on during adolescence. I think we also know that for all adolescents, the adolescent brain is dynamic, right? So what you see in the initial stages of a TBI may not be what you see going forward. And so in addition, obviously, to reassessing the, the sequelae of the TBI, you want to continually reassess that brain development and sort of just, you don't want to pigeonhole the adolescent, it's sort of like Rachel was just saying, you want to continually reassess post-injury. It can also be difficult to determine disordered versus different. So, you know, there's going to be heterogeneity in development and individual differences between people. And at what point that is the individual and what point that is the TBI, that can sometimes be difficult to distinguish. And certainly things to remember as their provider is, where is the injury? When was the injury? And thinking that, uh, thinking about the fact that early having an injury in early adolescence may increase the risk of long-term impacts on development versus an injury later in life that may just sort of have an immediate and sort of more of a static effect. And knowing that obviously injuries that involve the prefrontal cortex are going to potentially have an impact on the brain's ability to think about and exhibit sort of the risk or reward or inhibition and sort of appropriate regulation of behaviors. Not that that happens to everybody. Again, I think that's the thing. It's gonna be different in different people, but sort of keeping in mind where the injury is, when the injury occurs, and what parts of the brain were affected, and potentially what that part of the brain's function is as you reassess throughout treatment and um, follow-up. Next slide, please. Oh, other way. There we go. So there are definitely physical changes that can occur if your brain has a traumatic injury. So if somebody has a traumatic brain injury such that it affects hormone function, pituitary function, hypothalamic function, it can affect the physical changes that occur as part of puberty. It can also affect physical abilities, which will then affect sexual function, affects one's perception of self as a being and or their perception of their attractiveness to others and as you can imagine at any phase in life but certainly in adolescence where this is already something an adolescent is having internal struggle with it's just going to exacerbate that process we also know that injury to the brain can be a cause of precocious or delayed puberty and that has sexuality implications and what we do know that is of the data that's out there there's just less of it in females, which just behooves, not us as in me per se, but it behooves us to try and look for that research, to do that research, to get more information so that we're making evidence-based decisions and not just assumptions about how an injury might be affecting and not sort of lumping everybody under the same umbrella. There's gonna be differences in the genders. Next slide. back. I think we skipped a bunch. Just one more. Oh, next one. So, nope, oh, back. Sorry. So, we also know that in addition to physical changes, there'll be psychological and behavioral changes. So, we know that TBIs can affect inhibition, emotional ability, and understanding of social cues, which is, again, something adolescents are learning at baseline, but something that's going to be really important in order to appropriately and, and safely engage in any relationship, but especially a sexual or romantic one. We also know that these adolescents can then be at risk for exploitation or abuse, especially if they are 
physically developed, but perhaps their psychological development has been impacted by a TBI. We also know that the perception of oneself or mood changes can also impact one's ability to engage in a safe and healthy relationship and social skills. And we also know that mood changes can, can cause things like apathy or lack of interest or anhedonia. So the mood changes that can come with a TBI can certainly affect one's ability, interest, capacity to engage in any social relationship, but especially a physical or a romantic or a sexual one. And I think that's important, right, for adolescents and for everybody. A sexual relationship and a romantic relationship may be the same thing, or they may not be. They can have a sexual relationship for which there's no romance or feelings, and it's important to kind of make sure you flesh that out when you lesson. Next slide. And then it's thinking about the fact that, again, adolescents don't have a great ability to evaluate risk and reward. You can give me a medicine that you tell me that over the next five years will make sure that I'm a healthy adult, but if in the moment it makes me feel lousy, I'm not going to take it. So we know that some of the medicines we use for adolescents with TBIs, things like antidepressants or seizure medications or serotonin ag agonists, can have effects on your sexual function, on your sexual desire, on your sexual urges, on your ability to have a healthy sex life. And that may not be a side effect that the adolescent wants to deal with. And so that can affect adherence. And you need to, as the provider, make sure that you're asking them about those side effects because they may not know that it's okay to talk to the doctor about the fact that this medication um, affects their ability to have an erection, right? To ejaculate, to orgasm. An adolescent may not feel comfortable having that conversation with a provider. An adolescent may not want to have that conversation in front of their parents. And as a provider, you need to make sure that you facilitate those conversations. And then I think as Rachel was alluding to in the earlier slide, the fact that how does the TBI affect how that adolescent is perceived? Are they afforded privacy, autonomy, confidentiality? Are they seen as a sexual being and are they given the education that they need to make smart and healthy decisions about their sexual health? Yeah, exactly. So I kind of want to flip how we look at adolescents with a TBI because um, sometimes there can be a disconnect between a clinical diagnosis or the data or the different stages of development and an actual person, you know, living with a traumatic brain injury or a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and so kind of what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is how we see people. So kind of flipping the script. So instead of seeing somebody with a TBI as um, a vulnerable population, we see them as an uninformed population. So being able to figure out what's the information that they need so that they can make healthy, safe sexual decisions. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so yeah, it is. Um, so when we're talking about that vulnerable po vulnerable population versus an uninformed population, if somebody's seen as vulnerable, then usually information is withheld or they have a lack of information. They're at a higher risk for abuse or assault. Um, they're less likely to know their right and how to advocate for themselves. So to kind of know what they want and speak up about that and figure out who they want in their support system network. Um, and, you know, if they're seen as vulnerable, then they're, again, as I said before, infantilized, treated like children or treated as younger than their age. Um, and then their rights and freedoms are restricted or taken away in the name of safety. So if we see somebody with a TBI, a young person with a TBI as part of an uninformed population, then we know that it's important to prioritize education and knowledge transfer, that we need to work with them to make sure that they have the skills and the resources to make decisions for themselves. They're at a lower risk of abuse or assault because they're informed and they've practiced some really important skills related to consent, um, healthy relationships, identifying red flags, those kind of things. They're more likely to know their rights because if they're seen as uninformed, then the goal is to inform them and provide them with that information. And then they're more likely to know how to self-advocate and reach out for support if and when they need it. Um, and then making sure that age appropriate education and resources are provided based on their chronological age. And if necessary, adapting those resources to make them accessible um, based on what disability they have. So how their TBI impacts their day-to-day -day life. And then just making sure that safeguards are put in place with 
direction from that person with the TBI to ensure that their rights are intact and how they can get the assistance and the support that they need to be successful. Next slide. So why is this important? Um, we tend to think of extreme examples when we're talking about a person with a TBI or a person with a disability when it comes to sexuality and sexual activity. Um, and so typically we look at either circle A or circle C as these extreme examples of somebody is either a sexual predator, they're hypersexual, they don't understand consent and they make other people uncomfortable, or on the very opposite side, they are victimized, um, hyposexual, hyposexualized, they don't know about consent, they experience unwanted sexual activity or STIs or pregnancy. And a lot of the time, most people with a traumatic brain injury or you know, an intellectual or developmental disability, they fall right in the middle. So in this place where they're unsure how to navigate relationships, they don't really understand their body or pregnancy prevention, um, they don't have education about healthy relationships or condoms, birth controls, STI prevention. And what Mary and I are hoping is that we're giving you some information so that you can start thinking about people in circle B that are right in the middle before they get to either A or C. And that's why being seen as uninformed versus vulnerable is so important. Because if we give them the information and the support they need, then they're less likely to be um, you know, taken advantage of or in a position where they end up taking advantage of somebody else because they don't understand. Um, I, I was just going to chime in to say, I yeah. think depending on where you practice, how you practice, what you practice, don't be afraid to find out information that you don't know what to do with. I think the important thing is if you're asking the questions and finding out the information, then you can direct them to the right provider to address sexual health needs, contraception needs, mental health needs. I think a lot of times, you know, <laughs> for me in adolescent medicine, sometimes there's this anxiety about getting information and being like, oh God, now what? I think really the most important thing you can do is get the information because if you're a provider that they see all the time that they trust, you are going to be their person and you can be so important to get them connected with the right people. Yeah, and so I just want to give you guys a, a quick example so we can kind of put um, put a person example with all this information. Um, so previously I did some casework. Um, I worked with a woman who had a TBI. She was in a car accident as a small child, and so as a result, she had a traumatic brain injury and she was also blind. Um, and her her parents were very over overprotective. They um, sheltered her and babied her a lot, and they didn't really help teach her important life skills. So they saw her more as vulnerable than uninformed, just to keep hitting that point home. Um, and so she very rarely spent time by herself at home. She didn't really have any independent skills that she was working on. Um, she wasn't learning to cook. She wasn't learning to navigate. She wasn't really being able to foster friendship. She was spending a lot of time at home, either with her family or by herself with family that were still in the home with her because um, they were so worried that something bad would happen to her and that she wasn't ready for all of this information or for different relationships that she was interested in. Um, and so what happened is that the situation was created where she still had the typical desires and wants and needs of somebody in adolescence, but wasn't giving any opportunity to discuss them, to explore them, to talk about safety. Uh, and so she ended up meeting somebody on the internet and not learning about the, you know, what's safe in that realm either. And so on one of the rare occasions that she was home by herself, she had this person she met on the internet pick her up and she ran away from home. Um, and she ended up in a relationship with a much older man where it was a very unhealthy power dynamic. And there was, you know, there was some domestic abuse and some sexual abuse that occurred during that time. And a lot of these things could have been prevented if she had been given that age appropriate information and education to know about red flags and boundaries and advocacy and sexuality. Um, and so I think that if we can think about this girl catching her in the middle of those circles and not waiting until something bad happens to give education and help her advocate, then that would help a lot of people. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to review some statistics, statistics with you because um, people with disabilities, 
especially if it's TBI, intellectual, developmental, are more likely to be sexually abused and experience violence. Um, and again, we want to prevent that. So people with disabilities, um, they're two to three times more likely to experience violent crimes. And so people who are not institutionalized, so that means living out in the community, they're at a 40% greater risk of intimate partner violence, especially severe violence. So data in 2018 from people age 12 and up showed that 31.8% of men with a disability experienced violent victimization and 14.1% of men without a disability experienced that same victimization. So you see that the statistics almost double when somebody has a disability because they're just not being given the resources and the information uh, to prevent abuse. Um, and so when we look at that same data for women, it shows that 32.8% of women with a disability experienced violent victimization versus 11.4% of women without. Um, and you know we can we can all acknowledge that there's also an increased risk of violence for different intersecting populations. So if you have someone who is um, they have a TBI and they're an immigrant, or they have a TBI and they're a member of the LGBTQ community, that there's a higher risk of violence just because those two marginalized populations often get taken advantage of more. Um, and so this is just information we want you to keep in mind when you're deciding what information to provide to someone with a disability and how to most effectively teach them some of these skills about you know, sexuality and sexual safe practices and their bodies and consent. Um, and so we just think that's really important. Next slide, please. So um, how do we provide appropriate support? to young people with TBIs. We've kind of gone through this background information, but what are kind of the steps that we can take from this point on? Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, there we go, perfect. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, go back one. <laughs> so um, one of the things we wanna do is meet these young adults where they are. So treat them as an adolescent that's going through puberty um figure out what they've learned so far and depending on what they have learned you know you might be at a different starting block for someone if they have just experienced a tbi maybe they need to review some information because the way that their tbi has impacted them is that some of these skills are no longer there some of that baseline information is not present anymore maybe they've had a tbi for a while and they haven't been a part of you know, like sexual health education in schools. So you might need to start with some of the basics of healthy relationships and social skill buildings and kind of move up from there. Um, we wanna use teaching styles that work well for them. So we know that people learn using a bunch of different types of modalities and it depends on who you are and how you learn best. So kind of getting creative with what's gonna be most effective for young people. Is it gonna be visual components? Is it gonna be more of a hands-on practiced skill building. So maybe doing activities that help, you know, matching activities or demonstrations or something hands-on to, to really learn a skill, um, provide examples and model some skill building in day-to-day -day life. So a lot of the topics that relate back to sexual health and sexual decision-making are things that can be practiced in day-to-day -day life. So talking about consent. Um, it can be a really difficult topic to just start introducing when we're talking about sex and sexual activity. So talking about consent in just day-to-day -day activities. So consent of, you know, this is your schedule for the day. Is there something that you really want to change or that you need to change? This is what we're having for dinner tonight. How do you feel about it? Or this is option A, this is option B, which one would you like? So helping them practice those skill building. And you know, this is an opportunity to practice boundary setting, um, expressing their comfort levels, working on positive communications, healthy friendships, and respect. So there are a lot of skills that fall into sexual health that can be practiced just in day to day to make that a lot easier to understand. Um, and then finding curriculum that's been created with someone with a TBI or an intellectual disability in mind so that it can be tailored a little bit more to what they might need at the pace that they might need it at. Next slide, please. 
So um, it would be important also to utilize the independent living philosophy of nothing about us without us. So it's this idea of, you know, let's not talk about or to somebody with a disability without having that perspective in place as well. So finding somebody with a TBI to help facilitate conversation or education. Um, lean on experts who can assist with some kind of education. So that could be a center for independent living in your area, which is an organization that is run by people with disabilities for people with disabilities with a lot of skill building and goal setting. Uh, finding a, self, a sexual health educator with experience working with youth with disabilities or with TBIs so that they kind of know what has worked best in the past and how to help tailor some education or information and finding curriculum or information that's created for and by someone with a disability. Um, and then just making sure to check in with, with that person. So whether you're a parent or a doctor or um, an educator or just a community member, figuring out what does this young person have questions about? Because that'll help guide the education. If we start making assumptions on where somebody's starting point is, but that's not where they're at, we could be missing the questions that they're really interested in or the information that really addresses some of their immediate concerns or questions. And those things can, uh, we can help reinforce some expected and safe behaviors. Next slide, please. And then just using evidence-based or evidence-informed curriculum. So, um, you know, evidence-based is, it's usually gone through an extensive trial period to show that this program or these methods are statistically significant and impacting the population that they're targeted at. And evidence informed is saying, you know, our program is, or our curriculum is created based on curricula that have been tested. So we can say that they're probably going to have the same result and be just as impactful and as effective. And so this just makes sure that you're picking information that has reduced inaccurate information that the information being provided is not rooted in stigma or stereotype or negative self-perception. Because, um, you know, the last thing we want to do is give somebody with a TBI information that somehow tells them there's something wrong with them or that they can't be in a relationship or they can't have children or, you know, any of the things that they would expect to do that their peers might want to do. Um, and then just any content that normalizes the topics of sexuality and sexual health and sexual activity, um, that normalizes discussing it and normalizes the practices of it. And then just remember that we want to create an informed population because if we don't, that's when they become uninformed versus vulnerable. Um, next slide, please. So when we're talking about some curricula that can be really helpful there is curriculum by um it's a company called elevatus training and it'll be in a in a future slide on a resources page if you're interested in that but they have a curriculum for adults and youth um, with intellectual or developmental disabilities which again tbi can fall into just that's really tailored at healthy relationships sexual feelings decision making um the two images on the PowerPoint right now is just their table of contents. So you can see that this curriculum is very inclusive of a lot of different parts of sexual health. So do you want to have kids? How do you avoid pregnancy? What does it mean to get an STI? How do you prevent that? Um, you know, talking about what's appropriate to talk about or do in public versus private. What are different types of relationships? So uh, it just kind of it shows you that there is curricula out there that can be really effective and work with somebody who might need the information at a different pace or in a different way, but they still need the same content as their peers. Um, next slide, please. So supporting parents and guardians, because this is a really difficult topic, I think, for a lot of parents or guardians to talk about whether their young person has a TBI or doesn't. It's just it can be an uncomfortable conversation. So you know, the first suggestion we would have is to advocate for their young adult to receive sexual health education in the school. So having that access to sexual health education with their peers is going to be a really good start to make sure they get a baseline of education. Um, and you might still need to find support of additional programs or educators to meet 
your young person at their need level. Um, because they might need the information relayed in a different way or multiple times. Seek resources to foster conversations with your young person. Um, and again, there are some resources at the end of this presentation that can help do that, that can help guide conversations and kind of give some tips for parents. And those are tips that would be helpful for any parent, but again, it's targeted more towards parents of a young person with an intellectual or a developmental disability. Um, be proactive about education and conversations. So they're, you know, depending on how the TBI impacts somebody, that young person might not ask a question before engaging in an activity. That's pretty common for all adolescents, really, is to maybe act first and ask later. So just make sure that you're being proactive about conversations, even if it might be uncomfortable. Um, and then normalize feelings. So a TBI or, you know, a mild TBI concussion doesn't negate sexual desires or adolescent development. So just normalize that what that young person is feeling or going through is okay. And that's just part of the developmental process. Next slide, please. So just treat them at the age that they are. So as a young adult, it's really normal to question sexuality, have increased hormones, be interested in sex or dating or relationships, have a curiosity about pornography, explore masturbation. Um, and so it, it's expected at their age with their hormones. And so just remember, don't go by the mental age theory, treat them as they're aged, because otherwise they'll be very confused, they'll have a lot of shame, and they might end up getting information from a non reputable source that could cause a lot more issues or questions than answers. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, okay. Um, so, and then just normalize talking about sex. So, education that information, information prevents unintended consequences. So, ask about sexuality. Um, talk about attractions and urges, be aware that there might be family values or shame that affects an adolescent's willingness to share. Um, and we know that that's the case, that different families have different values and different family members within a family construct can have different values and that's okay. We just wanna be rooted in factual um, information that prevents you know, unsafe situations. Um, and then ask about sexual behaviors. Don't make assumptions based on whether the person has a TBI or not. Mary, did you want to jump in here at all? No, I mean, I think the important thing is, so it should, the, the adolescent needs to know that their healthcare provider is a safe space to talk about sex and sexuality. And I think sometimes, you know, they don't know that there's, it's a place that they can talk about it. And then sort of like Rachel said, then they go and they get information from somewhere else. And I think it's important to, we'll talk about that, I think on the next slide, you know, have the conversation with parents so the parents know like, hey, I'm talking to your kid about sex and you should be talking to your kid about sex. So you should be having conversations that educate them, that share your values and know that I'm having these conversations as well. And really also affording kids the opportunity to have those conversations with their healthcare provider alone. So I think, again, sort of like talking about suicide doesn't cause patients to do that. Talking about sex doesn't make patients have sex. All it does is make sure that they have the information that they need to make smart and healthy and safe decisions. And being respectful of family's wishes, but also knowing that the adolescent kind of has, and we'll talk about that again, the adolescent has the legal right to get health care for their sexual health, for their contraceptive health, independent of their parents. And I think sometimes that can be a little off-putting for, for parents to know. Yeah. Next slide, please. And I guess that's a good segue to sort of say adolescents are entitled by law to confidentiality as it pertains to their sexual health and contraceptive health. So don't forget the importance of interviewing adolescents alone without their parents present. And I think sometimes that happens to me. I see patients with eating disorders all the time and week after week after week, I really need their parents there. And sometimes that's just become the habit. And I forget to ask their parents to step out. So certainly if you've got a kid with a TBI that needs a lot of parental involvement to, to mediate and manage their health care, it can A, be extra time, but also it's easy to forget that you need to make sure that you're talking to adolescents um, by themselves. You want to make sure that you educate patients and parents about confidentiality and when it does and doesn't apply. Because um, I think sometimes that can be the first time 
parents hear about that. And I think appropriately setting the stage, hey, look, we're not kicking you out of the room to keep secrets. I want what you want, which is for your child to be safe and healthy and to make smart choices. And sometimes that means I'm gonna need any information that they wouldn't tell me if you were here, but it's what I need to know to help you help them be their best selves and make these safe choices. And goodmocker.org is a great nonprofit group that does a lot of work with adolescent sexual health, but they've got great information about the laws as they pertain to um, sexuality. And there's some great data that says adolescents avoid going to the doctor, don't talk to the doctor, and just don't tell things because they don't think it's confidential. So then knowing that this is a thing will also make sure that when you when you finally go, when you ask the questions that you get the correct appropriate answer. Next. Yes. Um, and so we just wanted to provide you some information since we mentioned that there was some intersection between LGBTQ population and people with disabilities that, you know, there is an estimated three to five million LGBT people that have disabilities. So we want to make sure that information feels accessible and applicable because um, we know that especially with young people, if they don't think that information applies to them specifically, they're more likely to let it go in in one, you know, in one ear and out the other, and they're not going to take it as something that they need to know. And so we want to make sure that representation representation of people with TBI and people who have, um, you know, that identify as being LGBTQ are being discussed and normalized so that people see themselves in the information and they find it to be more applicable. So this is just information that you can review at your own time. We just wanted to make sure you knew that that intersection of marginalized populations is very common. And then it's really important to ask all your patients, right? So again, open-ended questions, not making assumptions. Have you ever been in a relationship? What's the gender of your relationships? How do you identify? You know, making sure that you remember that everybody has a sexuality and a gender orientation. And so everybody should be asked how they identify in terms of their gender, not just, and I find myself doing this sometimes too, not just the people whose appearance might make you question their gender um, identity, but you know, who are you in a relationship with? How do you identify? What is your gender? Because again, you won't know that your patients are in this patient population unless you ask and identify them. And we know that patients, especially adolescents, who are sexuality and gender minorities are at higher risk for high risk sex taking behavior, substance use disorders, and mood disorders. So we want to know who those patients are because certainly the double, I don't know, the right, sort of having a TBI and being an already marginalized population, plus we know that, you know, not having parents' awareness or acceptance of this identity further puts them at risk just kind of means you need to know the whole package to make sure that you provide the most appropriate culturally competent care for your patients knowing who they are. Yeah, so well said, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide, please. And so these are just some resources to check out. Advocates for Youth is a great organization that focuses on information that's disability friendly and for and by people with disabilities. Elevatus Training is the curriculum that we looked at a picture of that they would be worth checking out if you're trying to figure out what content might be appropriate for a youth with a TBI. Uh, they also have some really great parent handouts and tip sheets for you know, educators as well. Respectability is a great resource. Um, there are there's a guide from Massachusetts from 2014 on healthy relationships, sexuality, and disability, and it kind of walks through some resources, some information, some tips. And then there is a fact sheet with sexuality after traumatic brain injury through the Multisystem Knowledge Translation Center. So there are a lot of resources out there. These are just a few to kind of get you started because we know that that part alone can be really overwhelming is figuring out where to go from here and how to talk to young people with TBIs. Next slide, please. So I know that we don't have much time, but we do have our email addresses here and we can answer some questions now and then anything we don't get to, we're more than happy to get to at a later date. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your expertise with us on this webinar. I have learned uh, quite a lot and been in the disabilities field a long time. Um, I, I just so appreciate your time devoted to the, this topic. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, 
one question I just want to throw out there, just so um, we could touch on this maybe before you wrap up today. Um, I love what you had to say about really addressing things um, from more of an uninformed versus a vulnerable population kind of um, perspective. Um, definitely a lot we can glean from that in the work that we do with the people that we serve. Um, I was going to ask, do you find that adolescents who have been exposed to intimate partner violence or who have been sexually assaulted, um, that there's a different approach, a more delicate approach, particularly for guardians that are working with um, those children. Any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I would think that there just needs to be a more trauma-informed approach of understanding that something has occurred and that person who has experienced some kind of abuse or violence, um, whether it's by someone they know or by a stranger, that the topics can be really difficult to talk about. And especially if they have a TBI where, you know, one of their symptoms is that they have a hard time expressing their emotions, that they feel a lot, but they don't know exactly how to express it, that just kind of letting them know, we're going to talk about some things that are really hard. And sometimes you might not know why you're upset or if you're upset, you might just start realizing that, you know, maybe you bite your nails when you get nervous. And when we start talking about some of these topics, you bite your nails. And, you know, if something makes you uncomfortable, even if you can't verbalize it, let's let's figure out a signal. So if you need a break or we need to talk about something in more depth, we can do that. Um, so I think just approaching it with a little bit more care and being really upfront that when you're talking to somebody, you know, there are not many people who can say that they're an expert on any and everything sexual health and sexuality related. So, you know, what I've found in working with young people is that they appreciate honesty and saying, I'm here to give you information. I might know more about some things than you do, but I'm not an expert and I'm definitely not an expert on your life and your experience. So if there's something you want to add, if there's something you disagree with, let's talk about it. Let's keep it open to have that dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, I was also just going to add in, in addition to honesty, I think it's important to explain why you're asking, right? So when I ask about the details as it pertains to your sexual health, your sexual orientation, identity, all the things, I always say, like, I'm not doing this to be nosy. I'm not doing this because I have any judgment. I don't want to say I don't care what you do, but you know, your sexual choices are your sexual choices. And if you're uncomfortable with them, then I want to talk about what that's about. But it is not for me to decide what you should and shouldn't be doing, especially for me, right? I'm your doctor. All of these things that I'm asking about impact your health. So I'm asking, so I know the best way to take care of you. I think especially those who are or in the sexuality and gender minority patient population may sometimes have uncomfortable, unpleasant experiences in healthcare that border on, are you asking questions because it's relevant or just because you're curious? And so it's important to say, hey, here's why I'm asking, here's why I need to know and appreciate that I know it makes you uncomfortable and we certainly will let you stop and, and be respectful of that. But understand why I need to know these things, why I may need to do a particular exam, and how it impacts your health. Yeah, and Maria, I would also say that you might end up talking about, you know, what what are some appropriate, like, you know, appropriate sexual activities or advances or behaviors, and you might be talking to somebody that doesn't even realize that they were abused or that they were assaulted or taken advantage of. And I think that just being able to look for those those signs of discomfort, just in general for anybody, when do they start acting a little bit different? If you're not their guardian or you don't work with them all the time, kind of doing a check-in afterwards with them or with somebody else in their life, because you don't know maybe the education that you're providing is the first time that they're hearing this and they're now thinking about an experience in their past where they're just now realizing that that wasn't consent and that wasn't something they wanted and it wasn't okay. Right. Perfect. Thank you so much, ladies. I, I, I just can't tell you how much we appreciate your time with us today. Um, Haley, if you'll pop to the next slide, we'll just close things out. Um, if you enjoyed today's event as much as I did, stay tuned for the rest of the series. Part two is going to focus on forming and maintaining relationships. And part three is geared towards more uh, complex presentation and treatment of individuals with problematic sexual behavior and, and hyposexuality. So I know you're gonna to wanna to hear those. Um, next slide, please join our other training events as well as our products, podcasts, and Leading Practices Academies. Uh, next slide.
Uh, we're hoping you will also save the date for our annual event, our 2021 State of the States Conference. Registration is now open for that. Uh, NASHA is a membership organization. Consider joining um, so you can get all the latest information um, that's currently on our website. And just lastly, thank you for uh, viewing our webinar. Please contact us if you want notice of future events. All of our archived information is available online. Don't forget to fill, your out, fill out your evaluations at the end of this webinar. And remember, the CEs are bundled. Have a great day and thank you. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you.